complete. People deserve better. Better service, better reliability, and better knowledge. As a full service wildlife and bed bug heat treatment provider on the eastern shore of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Our commitment, his commitment to customer satisfaction through client education and excellent service is unmatched on the eastern shore. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, guys, I think we're winding down on this thing. Everybody had a uh, good good session in the last three or four days? Yeah. Good. So I'm going to basically go over some inspection, inspection techniques. Also going to go over your value as an operator. Uh, you are and you do have value as an operator. And your clients need to see that. So um, my company is Wilkins Wildlife. I started it. I work for a pest control company that over five years ago had me removing bats with a shop vac and I learned that that was wrong. So we don't do that. <laughs> and it took me learning about Nicola for me to understand that that was wrong. So and in that five years that I have been in business, I have spent numerous trainings with Nicola, uh, learning from other operators. So there's plenty of operators in this room right now. If you don't meet each other and shake each other's hands, and have discussions with one another, it's a huge benefit for you to learn from one another. That's how I learned how to do this. Not just from my own making, but from other operators. <clears throat> your goals are important in your business and what you do every single day. You write them down, they become your fruition. I started this company with $383. I bought two tracks. Three days later, I got my first call. Two days prior to that, I got fired from my job. So, if you write it down, you'll have something to look forward to. The goal of this session is to uh, introduce tips and tricks, tools, to make your job more efficient, more productive. It's also imperative to understanding your time is valuable once again. You are valuable and you should be fair and charge your work. If you care more about what the competition is charging, you don't know your worth yet. But you will. Constantly keep growing yourself, your business, and your knowledge. Um, wildlife control operator is a professional, trained person to solve nuisance wildlife problems. Um, usually for profit, and you're typically licensed by state or federal government. Uh, you have to ask yourself if you're constantly training, and are you challenging yourself for personal growth? Or do you already know everything that there is? I come to every event because I don't know everything. Um, and I've got other people I want to train as well as my son. We're a father-son business. We're small operations. Where it all starts for you is a phone call. That's when gold starts to ring. And opportunity is always calling when your phone rings. It's also the same place you can dissect the dreamer from the doer, which is exactly where you learn what your value is. Most people will do an inspection and not charge a fee. I charge $195 to come out and assess and consult you with your problem. If you don't want to pay the 195, honestly, I didn't need you at a client anyway. Just the reality. Your knowledge is key. Whether you're the one answering the phone or whether you have someone from your office answering the phone. They should have enough knowledge to be dangerous, but Honestly, forthcoming with what the client can expect from an operator that's going to solve their problem. And I think we're all probably guilty of this. At least I am. A routine inspection is anything but, which is why most people will tell you that they don't charge for an inspection. What's your difference and what, why you're charging 
is because you're valuable. You're not like this valuable. If you're here taking training classes, whether it be a session, or whether it, you took AOTC, or whether you're taking bats or birds, you had to pay for that knowledge. And if you're paying for that knowledge, every time you gain knowledge, that makes you a valuable person in what you do. Every structure is different, every situation is different, and every client is different. There's no such thing as a routine inspection or consultation. The only thing that's routine is the same animals, call them the same damage, day in, day out. Your on-site inspection, everyone is probably going to do something different when you're on-site. Some people start inside, some people start outside. A lot of times that's weather permitting. For us, typically, I don't care if it's raining, snowing, thunderstorming, whatever, I typically start around the outside of the structure first. Then we move to the inside because we're looking at the structure as a whole. I'm not typically looking at the structure as the problematic animal that's there. Slobo probably touched on this if you were in his class earlier with full home exclusion. Um, you're looking at the structure as a whole. How can you solve the client's problem? How can you protect them? If you do have a little bit of a liability there, when you start talking about protecting a client. So when you're looking at the structure, you try to look at the structure always as a whole. But we always start outside first. Sights plus sounds and smell equal your evidence. Evidence does not lie. However, sometimes people do, meaning your clients. They like to exaggerate. When you ask what time they're hearing the noises, sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. Um, but animals do not cover the tracks, they don't clean up their droppings, and they're not vacuuming up their hair. They're also not putting down some type of peroxide disinfectant to keep you from getting zoonotic disease. How many of you guys have seen this? You got a crawl space vent that's somewhat screened and there's one section with no screen in it. Typically that comes from a rodent. There's evidence there. And zoomed in a little bit, you'll see the mice droppings there. <clears throat> this was a structure that I inspected that a pest control company was there and said there was no evidence of mice being there. How many of you guys run into that? That's because you're you're the professional when it comes to, to giving the right answer. That's what your value is. That's why you charge for an inspection. Crawl space vents are some of the most overlooked areas. All different types. Um, they're designed for airflow, but they also carry numerous flaws for entry. Screening does deteriorate depending on where you live at. I'm in a coastal area, lots of corrosive salt air. Those screens don't last for very long, not much, not very long at all anyway. And you've got options for, for solving those problems. Um, I typically use pest block for mine uh, if I have a client that has an encapsulated crawl space because they don't have to open and close the vent. If you've got a client that has to close the vent, you might want to use AAC's foundation vent guards. That way the client can open and close their vent as they would like to do. 85% of my clients don't even touch the vent. So it really just depends on you as the operator what you're trying to provide as a solution for the client. You either stop that entry point or it's just going to continue to happen. If you've never used them before, here's a quick look at what, what's available. These are the pest block covers. Um, these are the foundation vent guards from AAC. And these are from Viking Products. Jake Barnes product there at the bottom. Deal with a lot of vinyl siding homes where I live at in the coastal community. Um, a lot of times that bottom vinyl siding track is not locked into place. A lot of times we find that that's eroded into mice, squirrels, bad squirrels, rats will enter this area. <clears throat> when you're detailing your report, you got to check and see how that track looks. If it doesn't, you're going to have a unique situation for mice, rodents, even snakes. Um, other possible and other possible animal entries. If you overlook the area, possibly you'll be returning for some type of animal entry. 
The situation is easily corrected. You can install foundation wraps and pest block. I use a lot of pest block in my business because I have a lot of vinyl siding homes and this is typically a, an issue uh, with the bottom track not being locked into place all the time. You can try to pop it back into place, but because of how they cut it, it may just not lock in place, period. Now that's what foundation wrap looks like when it's installed properly. <clears throat> Understand with this product, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it yourself, don't use a solid product. It can crap water. If it does crap water, you're gonna damage OSB or any other type of backer that's behind the structure. Um, and then the client may want to hold you liable for some damage that they have. So make sure that it's a breathable product. Um, test block's just simple for me. I pick up the phone. I either call or text Will. This is what I need. This is what color I need. This is how many feet. And he always texts, got you. And typically in about three to five days, it's sitting on my doorstep. Entry points solve your problems. I don't know how many times you go out to a structure, the client says, I have a problem with, with state squirrels. I've had two other guys here, they can't find the entry point. When you're looking at a structure detail-wise, you're looking for certain things to tell you that that's the entry point, all right? If you don't find an entry point, you're not gonna be able to put the complete puzzle together and solve the problem for the client. Um, the evidence, that you're going to find will be able to educate your client of what it is, how it happened, when it happened, on the average. You're the professional at the end of the day. You just got to act like it. Next few slides are just basic entry points. Um, the pictures sometimes aren't the greatest because they may be distant, but this picture here, I had mice and flying squirrels both using. This was on a a five unit uh, townhome. This unit with the hole didn't have the problem. The mice weren't hanging out in the end unit. They were hanging out three units down. So when you look at a row housing, anytime you look at row housing, anytime you look at, at townhomes, you gotta look at that structure as a whole. If you don't look at that structure as a whole and you can't get everybody on board with it, don't put your name on it. Just don't do it. Piece there or over here? Oh, where the shingle is, that, that, that should be a flashed area typically. Or where I find most of my contractors, they'll flash. Some of, some of them will flash the area, some won't. It really just depends on what you're dealing with. Um, that area there is basically nothing more than a vinyl soffit piece that was cut and ran up against the shingle. Um, and it just kind of sits there and floats. They don't really seal it. Does that answer your question? Okay. I got a question about that. Sure. So what you're saying is, so as a townhome, normally people own their townhomes that are connected. They do. So if number three is having a problem, but the hole's in five, if five will not pay you to fix that, then you're not helping three. Correct. Okay. It's just unfortunate. It's just, you, try, you try to get these people to work together. Um, and it depends on the community. If you've got townhomes that are rentals and you've got a property management company, typically that goes pretty smooth. But when you've got individual owners and you've got one guy complaining about a mouse, I, I've been successful in doing it once, and here's how I did it. I excluded the structure, and in between the soffits, I would pull the soffit panels out, the last run together to connect those two structures together. I took the pest block, cut it, ran it all the way to the base of the soffit, made a pest block panel out of the bottom of the soffit, connected it so that now nothing could get in between the two. And I had to do that at four points on the structure. Um, but that was just because the client was like, look, I don't care, I don't want the problem, I need you to fix it. So that's, that's how I was able to correct one problem, but that's a, it's a, it's a huge risk. 
So would you make that your job to go to number five and convince them to do that? I would, it, it would be my job to go to the, the unit, each personal individual owner as a whole, and explain to them what's going on and explain to them what would need to be done to exclude the structure as a whole. Because even with a condo, set, well, I say a condo, even with a townhome setting like that, a lot of times they're going to have an HOA or some type of a common, common area that typically that they'll, they operate from. Um, we have an HOA community that charges X amount of dollars and they don't do nothing. <laughs> so it really just depends. Um, any other questions? That entry on the roof return, this is from the inside. Outside, of course, is just going to like any other soffit return that's there. The difference with the overlap and the batch we're using the lower section of a porch that ran out. And as you get into the attic, you'll see those things. Um, so you can just kind of connect your dots. Droppings and urine tell you pretty much everything that you need to know about what's going on and how to address it. This I see a lot of. I see a lot of garage door seals that are just old, deteriorated, weathered, either been chewed through. And when the client calls you for mice and there's an acorn sitting at the garage door, you kind of get an idea of what's going on. Um, I actually, up until about last week, had never replaced the seal. They're actually really easy to do. Um, this was a mouse entry, garage bay seal, the acorn wouldn't fit in, but the mouse would. This is funny. There's, there's a funny story that goes with this. So you already see the entry point there. This is an overlap board on the back side of that. There's another piece of OSB. The next frame that I'm going to is the actual entry point that the mouse was used, the mice were using to get into the structure. Um, and it's a it's a it's an area no different than the siding gap that we talked about earlier. Um, and every entry we see, out, we're thankful for. You know, without lazy cut rate contractors in the world, <laughs> where would we be? <laughs> We'd be working for them. So this entry point right here is a poured foundation wall. The mice were climbing up the foundation wall into that backer right here, or the board, not the backer where the OSB was here. And over time, they just chewed on it. They chewed on it because there were OSB pieces on the ground until that lip worked in right inside to the back side, and then they chewed that perfect circular hole in the back side of the other OSB. How many of y'all believe in spider webs? They tell you an awful <coughs> lot. They are your friends. They catch debris and fecal matter. This allows you to solve problems faster and you should always look at webbing for telltale signs of animal activity. It's real simple when you got cobwebs and bats. Typically that's gonna trap guano. It's light enough. Um, sometimes it's gonna trap squirrel droppings. Uh, we use cobwebs it's telltale kind of everything. Even in our business model where we have bed bugs, uh, spiders love bed bugs. You'll find bed bugs if there's a problem with spider webs real quick. I think everybody's seen this picture. We could probably add another 15 places to it. Um, but it's just you know the most common entry point. In, in our line of work, you get so used to looking at a structure. I'm bad for it. I look at the structure every time I walk up to it and go, yeah, it's probably a return. I think we've all probably done it. And then you get to looking at the structure. You actually spend time looking at the structure and you realize that the squirrel's done something completely different. Um, these are the most common areas where an animal can breach a structure. Never assume that these are typical animal or areas of entry. An animal will humble you real quick. This is my response to how I handle returns on a structure. Not everybody does it this way, but this is how I typically do it on most of my structures. Um, I'm sure, you know, John and Mark did a class on metal bending, um, and they, you know, you can either box a return out or you can just put a blocker panel in. 
a lot of my uh, homes at the beach are very seldom are they custom built homes. There are a lot of track built homes. Um, and this is what we run into a lot. We run into stop and pay they either cut too short and we got bat skating in through, we've had a squirrel chew into it. Um, I use pest block, pull the uh, facial wrap out. Um, I take the inside piece where the J channel is, put it in the uh, M12 folding tool, run one screw at the base at the bottom of the J channel, pull the facial wrap out, run a screw at the base which locks that panel into place. As you can tell, there's no screws anywhere on the front of that of that uh, blocker panel, and then there's just downforce on the roof. We use I use perforated metal simply because I don't want any water damming up there. Garage door seals, just like we just talked about with the acorn. These items have been allowing mice, rats, and snakes and other rodents to enter garages for years until you figure out just how easy they are to install. <clears throat> and added seal guards that go down the side of it where the garage door is, you can typically make those yourself or you can buy them from WCF. They're called garage door seal guards. Um, this track here is typically what the garage door seal rides in. You can see portions of it that are missing because it's been deteriorated. Um, I used an excluder one for the first time just because I've never done them before. Um, it's actually a nice product. Um, I've heard stories that you know rats have chewed through it, and I'm sure that everybody's had animals do things differently everywhere. Um, but the first night after we installed it, we didn't have any mice activity, which is what I gauged off because I had a camera set there in place I wanted to make sure of it. Tools of the trade, things that make your life easy when it comes to doing inspections. The ferret tool is a very good tool for being able to find out things that are in an inaccessible area. Uh, if you want a better view of what's going on in an area that you even can't get to, or you know, it comes with different attachments. Um, you can live lifetime video with it, uh, with what's going on. There is a light adjustment on it. I find this tool very valuable in my toolkit. Um, if you're not using laser distance measuring, you should. It makes your life easier. It's going to cut down time instead of you walking somewhere with a, with a wheel. Or Some guys I know are using Google Earth. Um, I really want to put a real number on it. That way I don't, I don't want to be off. Um, you always use tools that are going to save you time and money. Um, you can spend money once for a tool that works for a long time. And if you break that price down, it's probably worth its weight in gold. Um, these are two models of laser measuring devices that we use. We use the Lincoln Disto um, E7100. And my son uses a, uh, a Bosch 165, roughly, or 162. I ain't got my glasses on, sorry. Um, when you're trying to figure out the length of a ridge vent or you're just trying to scope how much material you're going to need to install for a soffit area, uh, something you're going to use for a metal brake, these tools make your life a little bit easier. Thermal and infrared detection. One of the coolest tools I think I've ever used before I got to wildlife operations. When I was in the military, we were able to use thermal there, so it just kind of made sense to uh, kind of incorporate it when we're talking about animals. If you don't have it, get it. We use our unit anywhere from three to five times a week. Um, they can potentially find larger animals and detect their body heat. You can't hide your heartbeat. It's also great for showing air gaps and moisture riddled areas. They can be purchased almost anywhere online at WCF, sells the C3X all the way up to the trigger type, which is the E8XT. They range from $500 to $3,000, depending on what you want to spend and what you want. When I started this business, of course, I didn't have $500. I got lucky. I walked into a pawn shop and there was a brand new one in the box for $250. I ate 16 crackers that night. <laughs> <laughs> but I was happy I had a thermal camera. The inspection backpack. This is a little trick that Matt Eichmann kind of turned me on to when I saw him do, I think it was an AOTC course. 
Um, I'm a Milwaukee fan anyway. Um, everybody's going to have different preference, but the backpack layout is the key for when you're doing an inspection. Um, this is what's in my backpack. I have a spotlight that's a Milwaukee M12. I have a black light. I have a neck light that sits around my neck with two little lights on it that's inside of the backpack. I only use those if I absolutely need it as a backup. My standard light is a 2021 Stinger Tactical flashlight. Uh, the laser measuring tool or tool or, or um, tape measure is there. The Flare C2 is inside. The Ferret Cam is inside. A couple biohazard bags. The Milwaukee M12 vacuum and attachments. The 4x12 canvas drop cloth. Extra nitro gloves. Respirator and the booger tool. Booger tool is a tool, little tool. If you're in an area where you accidentally drop something, a lot of my homes will have cathedral ceilings, so you've got to get up in an area to do an inspection. If you drop something down there, booger tool is your friend. Um, canvas drop cloth, if you've got clients that have pull down, attic access, pop up, attic access, you don't know what kind of droppings are going to be on top of there. You also don't want those droppings falling on your client's clothing or flooring or anything of that nature. If you put that drop cloth down, it's real easy to clean up and then you can detail clean up with that M12 vacuum. It makes your life easy. And it looks real professional to your client too. Show the client you care. Do you know your shit? That's important. I hope I'm allowed to say that. Too late at this point, right? <laughs> Too late at this point. <laughs> The inspection process reveals evidence that allows us to connect the dots faster by identifying the animal by fecal matter tract and or a visual. If you base your inspection solely on fecal matter, you won't know what's actually active, although you have enough evidence to consult your clients on a correction. The last thing you want to do is assume an animal is not present. We treat every case as if the animal is present until we can verify there is no longer activity. Misidentification the leading cause to us as operators being called because the standard PCO company has not captured a mouse in four plus weeks and the mouse droppings just keep piling up in the attic. Well, Einstein, that's not a mouse. It's bats. Metal return, soffit, bat droppings. Very commonplace to see those on an active bat infestation. Would you use the same pest block with the wavy roof like that? I would actually cut those out to the notches. And I would put a footprint on it, basically for downforce, yes. This structure here has flyers, grays, and mites, all three inside. Over a combined period of probably about three years. Gray squirrel droppings in an attic. We've all seen this picture. Haven't we? I see it a lot. Um, blue traps, bats in them, triangular mice, uh, bait boxes. We see that a lot. Raccoon candy. Specialty repairs. Uh, I'm pretty sure the guys went over metal scribing. Something that we, we got into, I'd say, in the last couple years. Um, I didn't realize how much I liked doing it until I did it. It, it is time consuming, um, but it looks really good when it's done. Um, metal scribing and bending, it's an art form. It takes patience, it takes determination. You either have it in you or you don't. Offering these specialty repairs are nothing more than you offering an aesthetically pleasing solution to a problem that some pest control operator would either foam or just roll up hardware cloth and throw behind there. Um, these are the type of repairs that you must know your work because they will consume your time, but the finished product has your name stamped all over it. And that's the cool part. You can look at it when it's done and you say, I did that. Um, what's your specialty? So, this is what happens when the phone rings, even though I don't answer it anymore. When I hear from Nikki that 
for the 8,000th time, I got a bat call, I just get excited. Um, you're a specialist in one or more areas of animal damage control or being a nuisance wildlife control operator. What you specialize in is what separates you from everyone else, including your competition. How good are you at what you do also separates you from everyone else. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't specialize. Trust me, you can. I was told five years ago I was crazy. You can't do this type of work. You can't make money catching animals. You can't do this. Now that same person calls me for advice. They say don't try this at home, so we're going to other people's houses to try it, right? That's right. <laughs> so, it is because we're professionals, we get to do this for a living. Some people laugh at us, but they're the same damn people paying us because they're too scared to deal with the animals and the diseases that we deal with. Our jobs are dangerous at times. Yes, danger and doubt live relatively close to one another. But staying safe allows us to balance between those two. Thank you guys for coming to the class. Thanks for being part of the co-op. Thank you for being receptive. Have a good day.